Here at Crosspoint, we love to be a church where faith and life intersect, where the truth of God's word intersect with the reality of day-to-day -day life, where we can connect in relationships, grow in our faith, serve with our gifts, and share the love that Jesus has shown to us. And that last aspect is really what this, uh, we, over this fall, we've journeyed through an Explore God series. And we answered seven with a bonus question, eight questions that are asked about our Christian faith. Um, as always, you're welcome to go catch those messages in our sermon archives. And last week and this week, and then we'll end um, next Sunday, looking at what, is it, what does it mean now to engage in those conversations and to develop those relationships with people that we might have the opportunity to answer the questions they have about faith and life and that the Lord would use those conversations to connect people to his saving grace. So today, the theme is a life worth inquiring about. And perhaps at first glance, it's like me taking an interest in someone else, which is certainly true of a life worth inquiring about. Every life around us is worth getting to know. Everybody has a story. But it's kind of the opposite of what, what about the life that God allows me to live is creating a curiosity, perhaps in someone else, to say, why do you think that way? Why do you operate that way? Or what makes you the person you are? And it's not about us, but it's allowing Christ to live in us and through us that creates that question, and the, through the question creates the conversation. So I pray that God's Spirit works in each of our hearts this morning, exactly what each of you need for your walk of faith, and especially to equip us to share the gift of God's grace that he's given to us. One of the great blessings of, of being a follower of, of Christ is he allows us to show up in this world to represent him. And that's both a, a privilege and perhaps daunting uh, at times. And a reminder throughout today's theme and message is what God calls us to do. The great thing about grace is he also empowers us to do it. And so we want to keep that in mind that what God is calling us to do is also what he equips us to do, and we rely on his spirit and his strength to do just that. And so when we, so we show up in the world around us, whether in the workplace, in our neighborhood, wherever God puts us, it's our opportunity to let our light shine and to make a difference for the Lord Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, is a, Jesus encourages us with these words, and then I want to read a, a similar type of thought that the Apostle Paul was inspired to write in Colossians, but first Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, where Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before, before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And then the, the Apostle Paul, is, as he has the opportunity, at this point he's imprisoned, um, but he, he prays for opportunities and invites us to pray for one another in regard to opportunities to share our faith. And then when God orchestrates those interactions, that his words would be clear in speaking, that he would have wisdom in dealing with uh, that situation, and that God would use the conversation that it would be full of grace and seasoned with the salt that God has made us to be. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. God's word for our heart this morning. I invite you to take out the message notes. A life worth inquiring about. What creates a curiosity in your mind to know something about someone else? One of the more popular and long-running magazines is People Magazine. 
People Magazine is just that. It's all about people. And the editors of People Magazine have to make the choice, what people are people interested in? And these are just three samples of covers of the magazine. Steve Jobs, connected with Apple Computers, Taylor Swift, the Princess of Wales. And as these people are on the cover of the magazine, perhaps you've picked one up or you have the electronic version and your curiosity about what's going on in their life intrigues you to read the articles. And maybe it's sometimes it's just, um, you know, what's, what's the latest scoop? But maybe you want to understand, like, what's behind this person? Why did they choose to do what they are doing? How did they get into that position? How did they form that company? What relationships do they have? What connections do they have? And there's something perhaps unique about these people that show up in People magazine that enough of the population is curious about that they sell enough magazines to stay in business. What would it take for you to be on the cover of People magazine? You're like, I don't want to be on the cover of People magazine. But what would it take that someone would go, there's something about that person that I want to know about? What would it take for someone to inquire of you? What makes you the way you are? Maybe some people have said that, have asked that. Maybe it's not always on the flattering side. Maybe you did something silly and you're like, what, in the, what made you do that? But perhaps it can be an honest question of why did you pursue that career field? What makes you act that way? Why is that important to you? That our lives as we interact with others create questions. And what the Lord is encouraging us today through looking at his word, especially through the words of Peter, the apostle, what makes a life worth inquiring about? The Apostle Peter, in, in his letter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, I have to say, I, I have used this verse many times. And the, the power of the scripture is the Spirit leads different phrases to jump out at you. The Apostle Peter, as he's writing to a group of Christians that were undergoing persecution because they were followers of Jesus, he said, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And I have to admit that I've used this passage and say, you know, you want to be ready to give a reason for the hope you have, but perhaps have skipped over or slid by a little too quickly the phrase, who asks you? To be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Which leads to the question, what would lead someone to ask me for the reason of the hope I have? Let's take a look at, uh, we have a couple little video clips uh, today. If you're in our small groups, uh, you maybe saw them Wednesday night, but they're worth replaying. So let's look at the first one of just thinking through what does it look like when people ask me about my faith? Probably 15 years, I don't think I've ever really initiated a conversation unless somebody has already kind of initiated some curiosity with me. It's, it, even when you watch Jesus, he didn't really start a whole lot of conversations. It seemed like people actually went after him. And then he, even when they would ask him a question, he would just sort of deal with it very quickly and then he would sort of back up. And it seemed like they couldn't keep from continuing to go at him. I found that's the same way in my life. People will ask a question about, um, you know, how come you and Cheryl don't seem to fight that much? And, and then I tell them that we do fight, but, um, but yeah, not as much as we used to. And then they ask, well, how? How do you not fight? And I remember one guy asked me that question. I said, Joe, for me to tell you that, I'd have to be really honest about my relationship with Jesus. And he said, that's why I asked you. 
And so at that point, then the conversation's supernatural because he's literally asked me to tell him about Jesus. A few months ago, I had a party at my house and we had uh, a neighbor that was my wife's real estate agent, uh, kind of head broker at her office. And uh, just a lot of friends hanging around, some of uh, his friends, some folks that were part of our church, uh, just kind of mingling together really well. And uh, Matt came over and he, uh, he just said, hey, Barry and I, that's his wife, were talking the other night and, and we just talked about how we don't have a whole lot to offer our kids. His kids were now, I think, six, seven, and eight, and I, they must have been bringing up conversations about God. And he just said, I realized that um, I have nothing to offer them. That and it actually goes, I, I think I might be spiritually bankrupt. And, uh, and I said, well, you should work on that. And he said, I'm trying to. And then we just went back to the party. and. Uh, and then it was probably four months later, just a few weeks ago, that uh, I actually walked into his real estate office and uh, he looked a little bit sort of bummed out. And I, I said, what's up, Matt? And he, he goes, remember that spiritual bankruptcy thing I brought up? I said, yeah. And I said, you're, like, you're not making a lot of headway on that? And he, he goes, uh, no. He goes, is there something that you could do to help me figure this out? And uh, so, yeah, so we've been talking now about God pretty naturally. I think it was assumed that Christians would live such uh, beautiful lives that people would actually go after them, knock on their door, um, call them, email them, whatever, uh, to try to get some help with their life. So I just wait till people uh, move towards us and then I just speak openly and honestly as somebody that's, that's just trying to figure it out too. So I'm not the answer man, um, but I am somebody that's trying to follow this real person that really makes a difference in absolutely everything in my life. And so it's easy to talk about that part of Jesus. The, the reality of just as, as life goes, as we, as we live the life in response to what God has done for us, it makes a difference. He mentioned his marriage and the raising of his kids, just in life in general, and the, the questions come. And perhaps you've had that opportunity where people have asked, um, something about what you're doing or how you speak or how you show up is a little bit different than the rest of the world. So there's three things that the Apostle, uh, the Apostle Peter said, what, it, what might be the catalyst that as God equips us and we live under the forgiveness of the cross, because I'll be the first to admit that living an attractive life towards outsiders is not always something that I'm doing. I mean, you can ask my family and that they'll be the first to admit. Uh, I'll be the first and they can confirm it. Uh, and so, I, again, I want to live under the forgiveness and the reality of God's grace in the cross. So this, this message today is not to in, instill guilt of the failures of the past. It's to proclaim forgiveness for our failures of the past are at the foot of the cross, okay? And the forgiveness and the power and strength that we live from the, from the foot of the cross moving forward is also ours because that's really the Christian life is in response to the love that God has shown to us. As the Apostle Peter is encouraging those to whom he writes, he's writing to a group of, of individuals that are certainly undergoing persecution because they're followers of Christ. And, and the first, um, as he leads up to that verse 15 and verse 8, he says, Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another, be sympathetic, love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. This first points out that one of the attraction factors that can stand out to other people is how we love our friends. And that's our first fill-in this morning. That a life worth inquiring about starts with how we interact with each other, in our families, in our friendships. And the Apostle Peter lists a number of things in that verse 8. He says, finally, live in harmony with one another. Does that mean we're always going to see things eye to eye? No, but it means that we're not going to fight, we're not going to bicker, we're not going to allow them to create division, but we're going to, we're going to live in harmony with one another. Because as God's people, we live under the reality and the focus of what Christ has done for us at the cross. We live in harmony with one another. So again, as you, as you think about this from an outsider's perspective, if they would come into a Christian home or a Christian church and there's a lot of infighting, a lot of bickering, you're like, why would I want to be part of that? That's not attractive, 
right? But if they find something among us as God's people, where there's people from different backgrounds and different dynamics, different culture groups, etc., and they're living in harmony with one another, go, what are, you, what are you guys doing here? Because I don't see that all the time in the world around us. Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. That, we, that we're engaged with one another enough to know what's going on in life. That we can have a, a heart for the people around us. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. This is that Philadelphia word. Love as brothers, as a family. Now, those of you that have brothers, your love might have shown itself in different ways. <laughs> that wasn't looking always too loving at the time. But maybe as, as time has passed, that bond has grown closer together. That we would do things Support one another, be there for one another, protect one another, love as brothers, be compassionate. We don't always experience, in fact, we probably never experience exactly the same thing that someone else does. And that compassion is, is that emotion, that feeling when Jesus said by his, his, his stomach churned for people. He had compassion on the crowds because they were like sheep without a shepherd. It's that, that heart of care and concern that's not superficial but genuine. Be humble. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about one another. It's about our Savior, Jesus. And as we put these things into practice, it's showing love for one another. And that's really one of the blessings of being part of a community of faith, a Christian community, is, is here's where we get to practice this. Right? It's not like we left our sin back home and we come here and now we're perfect people. We're perfect in Jesus, certainly. But when we interact, we may not always see eye to eye. Our egos may get in the way. We may not always take the time to be compassionate. We may not feel like sharing our feelings, etc. And God has given us one another to be in community with one another that we can show love for one another. The Apostle Paul reiterates this thought in Colossians chapter 3, he says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. And that's such an important reminder. Remember, you are loved. You are God's dear child through faith in Jesus. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues... Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now, if you would take this list and you put the template over places where you show up and say, does, does this parallel all the places I show up in life, the workplace, school, community, etc.? Or would, if I showed up like this by God's power and strength, would it, would it stand out? If instead of getting angry and bitter and judgmental, I showed up with kindness, humility, and forgiveness. I think this list stands out in the world around us. When you can show kindness to a neighbor who's in need, you can take time to listen to a coworker who's obviously struggling with something in life. Where you tell, help some other student or classmate you show up with encouragement. You show up with the love of Jesus. Because as Paul says, all of this gets couched under the umbrella of God's love for us. Over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Showing up just as a one who loves Christ and loves to exhibit the love of Christ can create a question. How can we show kind to that person? You always have a smile on your face. How come? You're always so encouraging. How come you forgave me for that? And I love how the video says, if, if I'm going to explain on this, I'm going to have to share you about my relationship with Jesus. I like that line. I'm going to keep that line. When the question comes, say, you know, if I'm going to fully answer this, I'm going to have to be honest about my relationship with Jesus, which then turns into an opportunity to share Jesus 
with that person. How we love our friends, how we love the people around us is a witness to the people around us. The apostle Peter continues in verse nine, he says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. This is counterintuitive a bit, isn't it? When you think about situations where you've been insulted, what's your natural reaction? Oh, bless you. If you don't say it, you probably think it of an insult to shoot right back. Oh, yeah? I'll show you. If someone harms you, it's the first instinct. Oh, I forgive you. Our sinful nature loves to rear its ugly head. When we're presented with insult, we're presented with evil, and it's our natural instinct to not love those who insult us or do evil to us, but rather, how can I harm them? And again, this is where I love to go to Jesus, what he did for me. When he was insulted, did he insult back? He didn't. Why? Because he was the perfect son of God and he knew that you and I would need a replacement, a substitute when we insult back. When evil was done to Jesus, did he repay it with evil? No, he repaid it with forgiveness. Why? Because he was the perfect son of God and you and I would need a substitute when we repay evil for evil and insult for insult because it's very hard to show up and love our enemies. But when God's spirit enables us to love our enemies and to repay an insult with a blessing and to repay evil with kindness, do you think that makes a difference? And people kind of scratch their head and say, what in the world are you doing? Well, if I explain, I'm going to have to share more about my relationship with Jesus. How we show up and love people that wrong us is a huge witness to that person and the people around us. Jesus himself said, as he taught on the Sermon on the Mount, so it's, it's easy when we think about loving our friends, you go, yeah, I can, I can work on that. That's not all that hard, but I know I have some opportunity, but that, that category, I think under God's uh, strength, I can work better. But this love your enemies thing, I mean, we can probably all think back in our past that there's someone that still, when we think of their name, it's just kind of inside, our insides turn because we're still angry, we're still bitter, we're still hurt by what was done to us in the past. And so to think about forgiving them, to think about being kind to them, you're like, I don't care if I ever see them again. This is where God challenges our hearts to be worked on by his spirit. Jesus says, you have heard what is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So that, that, was, a, that was a popular thing around Jesus' time. He said, it's okay, love your neighbor, but it's okay to hate your enemy. But Jesus says, but I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Reflect the same love that God has shown to you, to those around. Because remember, at one time, all of us were enemies of God, hostile to God, separated from God, didn't want anything to do with God. But God still loved you. God still loved me. So when I struggle to love those that hurt me, where do I turn? to the one who has hurt for me, to the one who endured evil for me, to the one who took insults for me. And when I go back to the cross and see what Jesus has done for me with his strength and the power of God's spirit, I can transfer that into the relationship over here that has hurt me, insult, 
than mean and repay it with kindness, repay it with forgiveness. And I get a longer discussion can be had about rebuilding trust. Do I put myself back in that situation where I was hurt, etc.? But in my heart, I can release the anger and bitterness. And as I have opportunity, even if justice is served in regard to our society, I'm not holding that anger and bitterness and resentment towards the person who has wronged me. Do you think that would make a difference? And people would ask, why did you do that? After what they did to you, why were you so kind to them? After what they just said, why did you say those words of blessing? Why are you praying for the one who hurt you so much? Because that's what Jesus calls us to be. And if I'm going to explain that, I'm going to have to share with you more about who Jesus is and what he means to me. How we love our enemies creates the question. Peter goes on. He says, whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. Again, the primary audience or the, the first audience that read this letter were those that were undergoing persecution for their Christian faith. And again, the natural reaction would be to respond in, a, in an unkind, a mean, a hurtful way against those that were, that were persecuting individuals because they were followers of Jesus. But Peter points out the opposite and says, who's going to harm you if you're willing to do good? Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. That part of enjoyment of life is not giving in to the anger and rage and bitterness that naturally can occur inside of us. Turning from evil, doing good, seeking peace and pursuing it. That these things bring true fulfillment in life. And as we walk in the footsteps of Jesus and we follow after him and the love and the forgiveness that he's given to us and the example that he's set for us, what he lays out in front of us is a pathway to enjoy the life that he's given to us, even when we're insulted, hurted, hurt, etc. And the Apostle Peter says we enjoy life when we keep our footsteps from evil, when we walk in the ways of the Lord, when we don't engage in a tit-for-tat, repay evil with evil. But what makes our life worth inquiring about is we love our life. We're enjoying the life that God has given us. And with God's help, we're, we're not in, embracing the negative emotions of anger, bitterness, rage, resentment. We're not spending our energy on getting even, repaying evil for evil, but rather we're expending our energy of extending peace and kindness, forgiveness, grace, mercy. For it's these attributes that have had an impact on your life and mine because they are given to us by Jesus. Would it not also make sense that these attributes, as God allows us to live them out, will make a difference in the relationships with whom you interact? That if we wake up and realize that our, our purpose today, no matter what vocation or what we're doing that day entails is simply to bring the joy, the love, the grace, the forgiveness of God into the hearts and lives of others, whether directly or indirectly, just by how we show up. King Solomon, as he reflected on life and wrote about it in the book of Ecclesiastes, wrote this, there's something else meaningless that occurs on earth Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve and wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. You could, that, we, you've probably rec rec wrestled with that yourself, 
right? It's like, I'm a follower of Jesus, but it doesn't seem like that's what... And Solomon observed those things. And he says, this too, I say, is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then the joy, then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of his life God has given him under the sun. King Solomon observed that the best way to go through life is with joy. When he applied my mind to know wisdom and observed man's labor on earth, his eyes not seeing sleep night or day, then I saw all that God has done. I wish Solomon was here to maybe expand on that a little bit more and say, what did you begin to see when you focused on finding joy, meaning, purpose, and life in God himself? And when we carry that mindset into our days, and you show up tomorrow morning, Monday at work, I know it's Thanksgiving week, so Monday might not be the same this week as because you're like, hey, great two-day work week or three-day work week, whatever it is. But when someone shows up on Monday living for Friday and you show up and go, it's a great day. Good morning. How are you? How can you always can be so happy? Why are you always so joy-filled? It creates the question. And again, I, I will be the first to admit I need to hear these words too. I can show up on Monday morning, even though no one's here, and be a little grumpy. I can show up on Sunday morning and inside be a little grumpy. I need the love of Jesus. I need his forgiveness. And I need his joy to continue to fill my heart as well. But as we show up in the relationships in the world around us with the joy that we truly have, as we sang in our opening song, Come People of the Risen King, what more do we need? To know that we have a living Savior and that eternal life is ours and that no matter what happens on this earth, whether it's the people Peter read Peter's letter for the first time undergoing physical persecution because of their faith or because our job is tough and we really don't enjoy it in the moment, that we can show up knowing heaven is ours. And while each day may not be perfect, each day I'm experiencing the love and the joy that God has given to me. And each day he's giving me opportunity to share that with others, especially when they ask the question. So be ready for a conversation. Be ready for people to ask. I love in Colossians that we read earlier that, Peter, or that Paul said, pray that a door might be opened. That's my prayer for each one of us, that God would open a door for a conversation. And Peter helps us be ready for that. How are we ready for that conversation? Three things. Set apart Christ as Lord, he says. In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Speak the truth in love. Set apart Christ as Lord. That's, that, that's where God's spirit starts everything. Where he puts Jesus in your heart and say, this is the most important thing of my life. And as Jesus is front and center of your life and your living life through the perspective of God's forgiveness and God's love for you, that in of itself will allow your life to be seasoned with that grace, with that love, with that peace, with that hope, with that forgiveness. So when people ask about your life, you are ready to give them a reason for the hope you have. You are able to give them a reason for the love that you showed. And as you have that conversation, that conversation then is seasoned with that same grace, that same love, that same forgiveness, and we're able to speak that truth in love because our hearts are genuinely 
caring for the person to whom we're speaking. And in those conversations that have been created by God through the life he allows you to live are ones that God will use to his glory. And as we think about those conversations, I want to show you just another short, about three-minute clip to just kind of think through as we have those conversations, how do we want to approach them so that God's love and his grace and his forgiveness shine through predominantly? It's my prayer that God opens those doors for conversations because of the life that he's given to you, that you have, because Jesus lived, died, and rose again for you. And as we live under the umbrella of his grace and in the reality of his love, let that flavor everything we say, everything we do. And as we show up in this world as followers of Jesus, underneath the umbrella of what he has done for us, I know it's going to create the question that will lead to the conversation. And when that conversation happens, I pray that your words would be seasoned with grace, full of truth, and express the love of Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the life that you've given to us in Christ. Thank you for the life that you've given us to lead. And Lord, as, as we engage in the world around us, let your love, let your peace, let your hope, let your joy fill our hearts so that it is only natural in wherever you put us to show up with the same attributes. And as we show kindness instead of anger, as we show uh, forgiveness instead of bitterness, as we show your love instead of hatred, Lord, we pray that we would be instruments Yes, of your peace and also of your grace. And Lord, use those conversations to your glory and to the advancement of your kingdom and the salvation of souls. We thank you for the privilege of being part of this work. Equip us for what you have called us to do. Forgive us for when we have failed. Empower us by your spirit for every opportunity. Lord, thank you for the relationship that you have established with us we ask you to keep us strong in your grace, in your love and your forgiveness. Lord, we pray uh, for all those that are hurting. We pray for where there is war, that there would be peace. We pray where there is conflict, there'd be resolution. Father, we pray for those situations that you allow us to show up, that we can be your instruments. All this we pray in Jesus' name, who's also invited us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We have one more week of our series of Explore God. Next week we'll finish with meant for more as we really embrace this purpose and privilege that God has given us to be part of sharing his message of grace. And then in December, we'll move to an Advent uh, theme, Born for You, which will carry us into Christmas Eve worship as well. So God bless your day and your week ahead, and may he open doors of opportunity for your life to cause a question and that question to lead to a conversation about your Savior Jesus. Have a blessed day.